So we're going to look at this issue of tipping points, and this takes us into the next stage, beyond the tipping point. There have been five major extinction events in the geological history of the Earth caused by massive volcanic eruptions or huge lava flow, or in one or two cases, possibly, major asteroidal impact. And it's interesting here in Tailburg, as we sit on this hilltop, which is part of the frozen shock wave stabilized in granite from that great impact of a meteor, the crater of which forms the basin of the lake whose beauty we admire on a daily basis. This was a local extinction event, believe me. But the major ones in Earth's, in Earth's history have meant shock jumps in carbon dioxide and that that pushes the system away from equilibrium and into very rapid change. Typically, they have wiped out 80, 85, 90, 95 percent of life on the planet. It takes many, many thousands of years for the geochemistry to recover and several millions of years for the biological species to recover any sense of niche filling. What's a tipping point? Well, here's a lovely illustration from Brian Walker of the Resilience Alliance from Australia. A tipping point of bifurcation. And uh, it's illustrated by a basin of familiar behavior, which varies a bit, but it's held by this uh, containing area here. And the behavior of the climate can move around within that contained. As the positive feedback build up, they can push that behavior over the watershed and down into another basin, a hotter earth scenario, from which it is very difficult to recover back into the stability of the previous one. That's a tipping point. Let's see how this goes. By the way, what I'm going to do next, actually, is take a line from about here, up over the watershed and down into the next basin. You got the idea? So that's going to be a cross section through there. It's much easier to work with. It's like the watershed between two valleys. You come up the path, over the top, and down into the next valley. Here it is. The original stable state equilibrium. The inflection point where positive feedbacks begin to have an effect on the containment. The unstable equilibrium where positive feedbacks and the containing damping feedbacks just balance out. And then beyond that, the accelerating feedbacks push the system towards runaway jet. Contained runaway, but it, 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 for our purposes in human life terms, it's runaway. Onto that, I want to introduce the concept of the critical threshold. Critical threshold is a point beyond which the power of the accelerating feedback overwhelms the human power to intervene and restore the system to equilibrium. There's a limit beyond which we dare not go. Oh, in terms of uh, costs, of course, and the energy required to make the difference, uh, it's the point towards which the cost of restabilizing the climate doesn't just go on increasing or going up slowly, as in the assumptions behind the Stern report. It goes up vertically to infinity. Beyond that, it would cost the Earth and still not restore the system to equilibrium. Let's illustrate it. Along the, the bottom axis, the power of positive feedback relative to what we can do about it. So in the early stages, easy to restore the system to equilibrium. Feedback builds up, more difficult. Feedback reaches the critical threshold here just on the limit of everything we can do beyond that, nothing we can do, it costs the earth. Costs up that axis, and this is what I mean by asymptotic increase as we reach the critical threshold. The costs escalate to infinity as that threshold. That's the point of merit. If we superimpose the two graphs, if we bring the equilibrium graph and the critical threshold into the same diagram, it looks like this. We're fairly confident that we've passed the unstable equilibrium and are somewhere on the downslope. The critical threshold beyond which we have no hope whatsoever of 
pushing the system back into stability lies somewhere, we hope, ahead of it. Costs escalating rapidly of making the intervention that is needed. And we've delayed 15 years already to make that intervention. We dare not delay longer. It costs more and more and more to make the intervention. The effects of climate change are building up. Resources have to be put into recovery, adaptation, insurance, social, social conflict, energy sources, food, water. The resources available to make the intervention decay as we approach this threshold. So acting now is critical. Okay, let's put in a time dimension to this, shall we? And this really gives a very good illustration. Here is the, the stable climate equilibrium. The bridge represents the tipping point beyond which the system moves towards runaway. The wall represents the crystal threshold that we dare not cross if we are going to avoid the sixth extinction event. So we can go for a walk in this valley system and we will move slowly over our history up over the hill and in our current continued business as usual or heading for disaster. The Kyoto arrangements and the current set of negotiations change the path a little but go straight on through the war. What is required is an intervention that moves us back, skirting the wall and comes back over into the state of stable equilibrium. Hmm. Let's summarize that. We're now in the early stages of runaway climate change. There's no naturally occurring damping, breaking system to stop it happening. It's our job. Strategically, we have to generate a negative feedback intervention of sufficient power to overcome the now active feedback processes. And by the way, in the time that it takes to make that happen, temperature goes on going up. And the temperature going up brings in more feedback. So our intervention has to be able to control and damp the temperature-driven feedback during the process of intervention. That is a very difficult task. Apollo 13 faced a similar situation. Climate stabilization is the strategic imperative for tomorrow's world. And tomorrow starts now. <laughs>